أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين Another very relevant contemporary issue that we are dealing with as Muslims is Islam and terrorism and of course the angle the approach that I wish to share with uh, the participants is not the political or geopolitical um, issues that are going on in today's world but rather the theological side of this issue. We know for a fact unfortunately that um, uh, this misconception of Islam equaling terrorism is something that has been um, further exasperated by uh, the media and uh, certain authors, writers, uh, Islamophobes uh, portraying Islam in, ver in such a very negative way and Islam being the religion of terror and the source of terror and uh, Islam as a religion being a danger to mankind. And there might be uh, two ways or two reasons to um, put the finger on the exact cause of why it is that some people see that the source of terror in this world today is um, Islam. And the first being the uh, concept of jihad and that uh, Islam has a military side to it. And this military side uh, is something that uh, poses a threat and a danger to uh, the civil society. And there are many verses that encourage jihad, like, let me share one example. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ أَعْضَمُ دَرَجَةٌ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَائِزُونَ Surah At-Tawbah verse number 20. And Surah At-Tawbah itself has a few other verses that also speak about the encouraging of jihad and um, things like that. So doing jihad fi sabilillah on the path, on the sake of Allah um, has the greatest of reward and, and um, everything else along these lines. So West, Western thinkers, they pause on these verses and they say that uh, Islam encourages its followers to eradicate the others, you know, to get rid of the other. You know, um, you know, when it comes to uh, treating the uh, person that opposes them, it is important to remove them. And no one else has a right to live except the Muslims. Now, of course, this isn't... Um, the correct interpretation which we're going to be seeing later on but that's the kind of um, uh, if I could say distorted uh, interpretation that some see looking at the surface uh, of these verses but for Christianity it doesn't uh, negate the lives of others you know Christianity um, in comparison to Islam doesn't have a system of jihad um, it doesn't, within the Holy Scripture of Christianity, it doesn't encourage in the New Testament, um, in the Gospels, any kind of um, active uh, military uh, work against other people. You are a human, you have a right to live, and you have a right to have your own idea and um, religion. Uh, cannot be imposed on you and you cannot be forced to follow a certain um, religion. That's the overall understanding. Um, number two, so the first is, is jihad. The second is that Islam does not value, uh, does not credit, give credit, does not give any consideration to the actions and the deeds of others, of non-Muslims. And therefore, they're just a waste. There's no purpose for them um, to be here. And therefore, they have no value. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the verse in the Holy Quran that is usually used. 
والذين كفروا أعمالهم كسراب بقيعة يحسبه الضمآن ماء حتى إذا جاءه لم يجده شيئا ووجد ووجد الله عند بأز for those who disbelieve سورة النور verse number 39 but as for those who disbelieve their deeds are like a mirage Sarab in Arabic means mirage in a low land which a thirsty person thinks is water until when they get to it they realize that they find absolutely nothing but they instead they find Allah they find God before them so this means that you know someone like Edison or Einstein or these kind of uh, people who really contributed to humanity uh, as far as their actions are concerned it's like a mirage doesn't even exist has absolutely no value so basically according to this and their understanding Islam negates the value of uh, actions and deeds if they don't ex accept Islam so you need to accept Islam in order for your your actions to have any value this itself is a form of terrorizing the other by you negating their value you're saying that you know uh, the presence uh, doesn't carry the same value as that of a Muslim now I'm not going to talk about the second part uh, or the second um, thing that has led uh, certain people to see Islam as a religion of terror because that's pretty much related to um, the value of actions and what's going to happen in this world to a non-believer, the hereafter and all these other things it's irrelevant to the concept or the topic of terrorism in regards to terrorism and in regards to seeing as to why unfortunately any time the word terrorism is, is used it's related to uh, Islam and Muslims so much so that you can see um, they have ruled out in the media they say they have ruled out terrorism that pretty much means that it's not Muslims you know it's some other kind of uh, uh, insane pe person who has perpetrated some kind of evil doing but when they say terrorism related or terrorist related you know the first thing that comes to one's mind is Muslims and of course this is created a stereotype in today's world and it's very very sad when we uh, come across these kind of um, problems and and dealing with them so how do we deal with it Islam uh, of course does believe in jihad uh, jihad is one of the branches of uh, jihad, uh, jihad is one of the branches of Islam and uh, we can see that jihad was introduced in Islam as a defensive mechanism to preserve and protect the uh, entity of Islam as a religion seeing that Islam is an all comprehensive religion that it caters to absolutely all different dimensions of the human being and society something like uh, the military side of this particular ummah, of this particular society, of this particular religion needs to be there. So it's, it's working, jihad works as a mechanism, as a system, as a rules and regulations within the perimeters of what has been presented by the Sharia. Ah. So it's not something random, it's not something uh, chaotic, it's not something that doesn't have certain laws set down by the Holy Quran, by the authentic Sunnah and uh, interpreted and explained in the most effective form by Muslim ulama themselves and so when it comes to uh, the Quran and Hadith itself it's very important for us um, to, be, uh, to have to analyze these verses, analyze these traditions and decipher them in such a way where it falls in concordance with what it is that Islam as a religion wishes to promote. Now, if a certain group was to misinterpret this 
or out of malice intent and with evil um, objectives, they wish to interpret these uh, sources in such a deviated, perverted way, then that means that it is going to fall out of the authentic mainstream explanation or understanding of Muslims and Islam. And so jihad itself has conditions, it has laws, it has circumstances, all based on our fundamental Islamic characteristics. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ So, fight those who are fighting you, but do not transgress. Indeed, God does not love those who transgress. So here, this verse is clearly saying, fight those who are fighting you. So that's the kind of defensive um, side of the principle of jihad and not the offensive side. And there are other verses in this regard as, as well, you know, um, where we can see that because the Muslims were at danger because they were being um, besieged by all of the enemies of Islam, especially in the early advent of Islam, and they were being humiliated and they were being degraded and attacked and abused. No society, no government, no religion is just going to sit back and allow this transgression, transgression to occur. There is no country and no government on this earth that would freely allow their land to be taken without them being some kind of resistance. Now, to what extent is this resistance? Well, you know, this is for the circumstance to show. But Islam as a religion is not a passive religion in that sense where they can be treaded all over, a Muslim Ummah can be treaded all over and not react in any way. You know, if you were to look at all of the countries, well, if not all of the countries, then the overwhelming majority of countries and governments in this world, they do have a defense ministry. They do have an army. They do have a navy and they spend a very large portion of um, their revenue on this. And clearly that means that there is a need for this. Here the difference is that in Islam, it is within the boundaries of the religion, whereas in other civilizations or other societies or maybe even other religions, it is something governed and dealt with by the state itself, by the government itself. So, for example, in the United States of America, you know, we don't need to say any more about how much it is that they have as far as their obsession with um, artillery and, and the uh, warfare um, weapons and military and things like that. But it's not something coming from scripture itself in that particular sense, but rather something that the government is dealing with. Now, this is where we need to pose that important question, and that is that if um, military force is to be used, offensive or defensive, should that be governed by religion or should it be governed by the state? You know, this is a, a question and there could be different views as far as this is concerned. Unfortunately, um, Muslims are being forced to accept the uh, Western kind of interpretation of who has authority when it comes to um, military defense and things like that. Anyway, uh, jihad itself is not some general law applicable to everyone and to everything,
but it is specific for certain circumstances under um, very, very uh, precise conditions and many, many rulings are related to it. Another case for the circumstance of jihad is uh, defending those who are the underprivileged, those who are weak, those who are being oppressed. So it's not here an issue of defending the um, territory of uh, Muslim land. Here it's in the sense of uh, coming to the assistance, to the aid of those who are being, um, those who are being oppressed under the tyranny, tyranny of a certain ruler. Now, this is something that Islam has presented, you know, in today's world, you know, the United Nations has been given this kind of right, and that every country has a right to live in sovereignty without interference of other countries, and, you know, the UN has been, has delegated itself to uh, interfere and intervene in any country in order to help uh, it achieve its freedom within the dignity that they deserve. Islam here says that you need to help these kind of people as well. And this is why, um, for example, in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, um, and if Allah had not repelled some people by others, the word the world, the earth, the world would fall into corruption, would have fallen into corruption. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 251. So, it is important to repel others who transgress and attack. Another case is those who are going to use some kind of psychological um, warfare against you, some kind of uh, media warfare against you. You know, it might not be physical, it might be mental and psychological. And this is creating fitna, spreading rumors, some kind of disruption and um, discord in the Muslim Ummah. Um, this is the ayah that is usually used. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ Surah Al-Anfal verse number 39. So um, someone who creates mischief and problems and all of these other things um, become an enemy to the world, become an enemy to peace, become an enemy to Islam and so therefore you know they need to be uh, stopped. Now, how do they uh, stop? How are they stopped? You know, this is again something that um, is spoken about in detail. The important thing here that needs to be mentioned is the fact that Islam uh, promotes safety and security, um, believes in the sanctity of uh, the human life, believes that um, one should respect the rights of others, whether they be fellow Muslims or even non-Muslims, you know, and there are laws implemented, you know, unfortunately there's this whole controversy about how humiliating and degrading the concept of dhimma is, but that's something that you need uh, to look into. Does dhimma really uh, humiliate the non-Muslim? Well, if a Muslim has zakat and all of these other uh, financial obligations to the uh, Muslim Ummah. A non-Muslim, you can't impose zakat onto a non-Muslim, but, but there, might, there must be, there needs to be something for them to, you know, uh, give back to the society that they're living in. And that's the Islamic concept of tax. You know, if you're living in, in, in a country and you don't believe in the government of that country. You still need to pay taxes and that's exactly how today's society is. So jihad is a defensive principle. It's not an offensive principle. It's not um, attacking or invading. Um, Islam is all about hukuk and rights and you have a right to wear what you want, to um, do what you want um, and live 
within the sovereignty of the country that you are in. And um, if someone is going to create any mischief, whether under the pretense of Islam due to their distorted kind of interpretation or something like that, the rest of the Muslim world should not be held accountable and be condemned based on that. There are many issues that should be discussed in this regard, but uh, inshallah with your further reading and looking into this topic, you'll be able to uh, find many uh, issues that are very interesting on uh, this area. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. Thank you.